Voynich Manuscript. Dating back to the late 15th century, the Voynich Manuscript is famous amongst cryptographers for its confounding text, punctuation-free construction, and meticulous illustrations of unidentifiable plant species. The history and meaning of this folio is much contested. Proposed interpretations range from a pharmacological almanac to a forged manuscript by Franciscan friar Roger Bacon to a transcript of Glossolalia. Named for Wilfred Voynich, a book dealer who purchased it in 1912, the manuscript is presently on exhibition at Yale University, where it has lived since 1969. To date, the book's secrets remain a mystery. That was a video from Dan Brown, and it's part of his unsolved puzzle on his website, and I have a different video about that. But this one here is the Voynich Manuscript, and really uh, it uh, seems to be a book, you know, about flowers or something like that. But according to Wikipedia, it's an illustrated codex handwritten in an unknown, possibly meaningless writing system. And we can also see that it's been carbon dated to four, the early 1400s, and the text may have been composed in Italy during the Italian Renaissance. And the reason why Dan Brown brings it into his puzzle is because it's been studied by professional and amateur cryptographers and code breakers, and uh, it's never been deciphered, and the language of it has uh, never been identified. And I was doing some research on Tartarians, and I was reading this book, Disquisitions, on the Antipopal Spirit, which produced the Reformation, its secret influence on the literature of Europe in general, and of Italy in particular. And Italy is quite interesting here, because Italy is... You know, that brings us a uh, connection once again to the Voynich Manuscript as the uh, text may have been co composed during in Italy during the Italian Renaissance. And for such an ambiguous title, this book actually has a lot of really interesting information about Tartarians, uh, Prester John, and that's what brought me to this connection to the Voynich Manuscript. And here it was talking about Marco Polo, which is interesting because Marco Polo's book talks about how he visited the Tartars and went into their land. But here it relates, uh, Marco Polo relates that the Tartars are so clever and ingenious and so sagacious in investigating the nature of things that they can raise darkness whenever they will. So I don't know if this is, you know, like a smoke bomb or if, if they actually have, you know, can they make a cloud and block the sun out? I'm not sure. And he relates the case of one who by means of this art, escaped with difficulty from robbers who had surrounded him. Also that a Tartar army, being once defeated and nearly put to flight, had recourse to the same art to stop further losses, and by enchantment caused a thick darkness to overspread the enemy's camp. We might also venture to declare the name of a standard bearer who performed this miracle and disappeared with all his followers from before the eyes of his persecuting foes. Prester John, the tributary of the Emperor of the Tartars, will explain to us the mystery of the before-mentioned miraculous disappearance and the hundred tales of the gentle language written for those of noble heart and subtle intellect in which language flowers are mixed with other words. We read as follows. And that's when it hit me. This sounds exactly like the Voynich Manuscript. A gentle language, and you can see it's in italics, so it's, that's the name of the language. It's called the gentle language. It's written for those of noble heart and subtle intellect, in a language which the flowers are mixed with other words. And when I look at the Voynich Manuscript, that's a perfect description. I don't think there's a better example of an unknown language in which the flowers are mixed with other words. This is the best example that probably exists. 
Prester John once sent the Emperor Frederick II, who was very fond of gentle language, a present of three valuable stones. But the monarch had no idea of how to make use of them. Prester John's lapidary addressed Frederick one day as follows. Sir, the first stone is worth your best city, the second is worth your finest province, and the third is worth more than your whole empire. Thus he took hold of the three stones, and the virtue of the last concealed him from the view of the emperor and the people. So the lapidary vanished from the site and carried back the stones to Prester John because Frederick II did not know how to make proper use of them. And this is the first of the hundred tales of the gentle language. And I've tried to Google and search for this language and there's, there's really nothing that comes up. Uh, you, you really just find a reference back to this book. But it seems to me that the, this gentle language for the noble of heart and subtle intellect with flowers mixed with words is the Voynich Manuscripts language. So I would say that the language used in this is most likely called gentle language. And Prester John gave him the three stones as a gift and uh, the guy up and disappears in the thin air and the king's like, no, nah, get these stones out of here. I don't want anything to do with this. I'm, I'm going to disappear next. So he sent them back to Prester John. And Prester John, according to the testimony of numerous writers of romance, was a native of Tartary and had a romance with the daughter of the king of Cathary, who had a stone which she could vanish from the site whenever she felt inclined, merely by putting it into her mouth. But of this lady who have no time to speak, uh, I would like to know a little bit more. With this Talmistic stone in the mouth, the organ of speech, or in the hand which guides the pen, Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, also a hundred more, were able to vanish from before our eyes. And what is this miraculous stone? It is the word of God. The stone is Christ. And the angels taught that secretarian who visited them at all times that the ancient word of God is still preserved among some people of Eastern Tartary with the relative worship by correspondences and those angels who had spent their days of their mortal lives there affirmed that it is the ancient word. So I'm not sure how to understand all this, but apparently there is some word of God the stone is Christ that so you put the stone in your mouth and you disappear and that is Christ. I don't, I don't understand uh, everything about what this is saying, but here in the encyclopedia of Freemasonry and its kindred sciences, we find a very similar story in this celestial Jerusalem. The word formally communicated by God to Moses is found. This word is Jehovah lost on earth but which he invites us to find in Great Tartary, a country still governed, even in our days, by kings, by which he means allegorically to say that this people most nearly approach the primitive condition of the perfection of innocence. And it sounds like, you know, if these would be the people of God or something like that, uh, the primitive condition of the perfection of innocence sounds somewhat similar that the ancient word of God is still preserved among the people of Eastern Tartary and that the angels who spent their days there affirmed that it, this is the ancient word. So is this ancient word from the uh, gentle language and that ancient word or gentle language is preserved among the people of Eastern Tartary? This is a map from 1635, which is showing religions across the earth. And uh, in Asia are the Christians under the Patriarch of Jerusalem. And so this definitely confirms that the lost ten tribes of Israel went from Israel or Jerusalem up into, up into here, uh, Tartary. And we can see that in Tinduk, which is essentially a part of Arzareth, where the lost ten tribes were deported to, that we have the most concentration of Christians. We have many Christians in Tinduk, which again, Tinduk is 
is in the uh, vicinity of Arzareth, where the ten tribes of Israel were were sent here in this um, upper northeastern section of Tartary. You'll find Azareth, and you'll see here that that is where many Christians come from. And as you get further away from Tinduk, there's less and less Christians. Some Christians, some Christians, Christians, some Christians. But over in Europe, you get the Protestants, uh, the, the Papists. And it seems that as the Tartars spread across the earth, that they, spread, that they were the cause of the spread of Christianity, it seems. One more interesting part of this book here says that, that the Tartars had been shut up in the mountains of Gog and Magog, which are mentioned in the Apocalypse by Alexander the Great, and they remained there until the year 1202. And that's when they left their place of concealment, dispersed themselves as conquerors into many countries, and from that time held the owl in great honor. But the fact that they remained there until the year 1202 is pretty interesting because it says after that, they left their place of concealment and dispersed themselves as conquerors into many countries. And we find that same exact uh, historical connection all over the place. Here is one where we have Tartary, which certainly is the first nursery from where the Americans were transplanted. In other words, Tartary is where Americans originated from. They came from Tartary into America. So th that's why it's the first nursery from where Americans were transplanted. Once again, we have a reference that old Tartary, according to this fella, is the habitation of Gog and Magog. And that the Tartars, which about the year 1228, under the command of Zingis Khan, overpowered the earth like a flood. They were the successors of the ten tribes of Israel, and even the name Tartary or Tataria seems to be some testimony thereof because it signifies in the Seer or Hebrew tongue remnants or remainders seemingly because the Tartarians were the remainders of the aforementioned tribes. Even the northern Tartary herdsmen prefer to this day the names Dan, Zebulon, and Naphtali which are three of the names of the lost tribes of Israel. And more importantly we see that the Tartars around the year 1228 overspread the earth like a flood which corresponds with them being freed from Alexander the Great's captivity in the year 1202 when they left their place of concealment and dispersed themselves as conquerors into many countries. It seems as though taking with them Christianity and spreading that across the globe sometime around 1200. And we've definitely got off track from the Voynich manuscript, but... I do find it very interesting that it seems that from the Voynich manuscript it is most likely written in the gentle language, the language in which flowers are mixed with other words. I don't know if this correlation has ever been made, but it seems to me that the language used to write this book is called gentle language. and certainly has connections to Tartarians, uh, specifically in this case, Prester John.